We're continuing the doctrine of love. This is the third increment in the series. And we are ready to move on to point F. And uh, that point says this, that the mandate in the Word of God to love everyone refers to unconditional love, not attraction love. Let's look at a few passages of Scripture, beginning in John 13, verse 34 where our Lord is speaking and he says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And verse 35 continues, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. There we have the commandment. It's a mandate. <coughs> Pardon me. The word entole in the Greek, E-N-T-O-L-E, is the word for mandate or commandment. Uh, the uh, word another, one another, is another of the same kind, and this is a general reference, of course, to the entire uh, human race. Uh, you're to love everyone in the same way that I, the Lord Jesus Christ, loved you. Uh, and, uh, of course, he loved the whole human race with an, an unconditional love. If we turn to Romans 13, verse 8. Romans 13, 8, we'll, uh, uh, where we read these words. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. Then he talks in verse 9 about the commandments and so forth. And then he says this, whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And of course, uh, we're going to talk about the words for love in a moment, but uh, in all of this, we have the principle of uh, agape or agapao, love. All right, uh, if you will uh, look to uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, where we read in verse 22 this statement. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. Very interesting passage. Uh, and the word uh, that is translated uh, deeply uh, is uh, the word a hoop on on hupo crites and uh, that is not well translated as uh, uh, as it is deeply uh, for it is the it is without hypocrisy it is genuinely it is real for it comes from the greek word uh, that uh, is used uh, for uh, uh, we transliterated hypocrite and so it, it refers to uh, the a genuineness a reality of, of this kind of a love I don't like the word sincere uh, as New American Standard translates it because sincere is, sincerity is, is a facade for, and an excuse for uh, <laughs> not being real but uh, uh, at any rate, uh, we do we understand what he's talking about when Paul when uh, Peter uh, adds. Uh, so we've we've read something we'll, uh, that John has said. We've seen what Peter uh, has said. We've seen what Paul has said. Uh, we'll look again at uh, at First uh, John when we go back to John again. First uh, John, 1 John uh, chapter uh, three, uh, where in verse eleven he makes this. He says, "This is the message." you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. 
First John 3:11 says, "This is the message you heard from the beginning." <coughs> Pardon me. We should love one another. And then in First John 3:23, this is His command: to believe in the name of His Son Jesus Christ and to love one another as He commanded us. Then First John 4:7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for God, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. And then 1 John 4, 11, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. So we have a number of mandates which are given here in the passage, the passages we've looked at, that come from God regarding loving one another. <coughs> Pardon me. God never commands us to do something that's impossible. And that would be to have attraction love for everyone. But the mandate requires something that is virtuous, magnificent, and really unusual. For only unconditional love has virtue. It is the love of the Christian resulting from being filled with the Holy Spirit learning and applying Bible doctrine. This is the love which comes in spiritual adulthood. It is impossible to fulfill this command in spiritual childhood because we yet do not have enough doctrine and the ability to comprehend the kind of love that requires us to love all mankind. To tell someone you don't know or you can't stand that you love them is hypocrisy at best. This, therefore, turns out to be sin, human good, and evil. There are some churches uh, where uh, uh, somewhere in the service uh, they may have everyone stand up and uh, sing a chorus of some kind and then before you sit down, turn around and tell three people you love them for Jesus' sake. Well, uh, they try to cover their tracks by uh, using for Jesus' sake, but that's ridiculous. See, uh, uh, you cannot have uh, an attraction love for this kind of people. But there is a kind of love that fulfills the divine mandate. And it is unconditional love. Now, the two Greek words for love which are found in the New Testament are uh, agapao, Looks like this, A-G-A-P-A-O. And the second is phileo, P-H-I-L-E-O. Now God uses agapao for his mandate to love everyone, which means the unconditional love that you attain in spiritual adulthood. Phileo is used for attraction love. But agapao is the specialized soul love which comes from the filling or the control of God the Holy Spirit. Phileo, being a complete and total soul love and rapport, must develop over a period of time. And there will be certain members of the human race that you will have a phileo love for. Now, you have perhaps heard uh, some preachers say, in fact, I heard Steve Brown say it, and I wrote to him and got a, a reply from one of his uh, uh, staff that said that he got it from uh, uh, another great preacher. Well, I think that uh, with his uh, uh, being a seminary professor, he should get it for himself and not necessarily uh, parrot what someone else has said just because the man is a great preacher. But what he said was, is that agapao is God's love and phileo is man's love. And that is not true. Uh, if you study, uh, and I recommend it to him, that he look up Trench's synonyms of the New Testament to find the difference between the two kinds of love so that he could use it correctly. Uh, agapao is basically a mental attitude love. Uh, phileo is a complete and total soul love. It is not, uh, so often it is considered to be a, a, an inferior kind of love, uh, but it is not uh, necessarily. It's just a different kind of love. 
It is, it is a love which consumes the self-consciousness of the soul, the mentality of the soul, the uh, uh, norms and standards of the soul, the emotions of the soul, all of these things. And it's a much more encompassing kind of love, but it is limited to those who are attractive. Now, uh, some, uh, and, and we, don't, we can't make a hard and fast rule and say Agapao always refers to unconditional love and uh, Phileo always refers to attraction love. But we're talking in terms of generalities, and this is true because, see, phileo is never, ever commanded upon the believer. Uh, we're never commanded to have a total soul or a poor love for uh, everyone. Uh, it, it's too soul-encompassing. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, you're not expected to have uh, a kind of a love for someone that, that uh, is, uh, totally consumes your whole soul. Agapao is a mental attitude love. And, and that doesn't mean it's any, it's inferior. It's not as far encompassing. That's the difference. And uh, some, so sometimes uh, agapao is conditional. Sometimes it's, it's unconditional. Sometimes it has attraction love. But, so the context has to tell us. But uh, the love that is commanded upon us is unconditional because it means that the subject has the ability to accept all people as they are. That is, no mental attitude sins toward any member of the human race. It means that the greater your virtue as the subject, the greater the scope or the range of the objects of your love. You're commanded to love the brethren. You're commanded to love your neighbors, that is, those in your periphery. You're commanded to love everyone. Well, this is a, a, an impossibility apart from the provision of God's grace, and that is the filling or the control of God the Holy Spirit. And so we'll see more about that after a bit. But uh, you can never have unconditional love for everyone until you begin with attraction love for God, the only attraction love with virtue as I have been teaching you. This therefore becomes your motivational virtue, for you must be motivated to love everyone. You have no natural motive in your sinful self to love everyone. Actually, the smarter you are, the more selective you are, and the fewer people you will love. And long before you reach the point of spiritual maturity, you must take in doctrine, the doctrine of positional sanctification, and make uh, the correct application so that you understand that your background, race, color of skin, IQ, or culture, and personality are never issues in the human race. The application is that you are simply a person for whom Christ died. You must make this application to others, and sooner or later you must shed all of your prejudices if you are going to grow in grace and advance spiritually. These prejudices can only be removed by God the Holy Spirit and consider the, the continuation of taking in Bible doctrine day in and day out. As our Lord uh, himself said in John 13, now you are clean, uh, uh, pardon me, John 15, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. How others regard you is not an issue. You regard yourself as a person in God's plan. Uh, I was watching the uh, uh, first uh, uh, episode uh, of a new sitcom uh, featuring Louis Anderson, the uh, rather fat comic, uh, and uh, uh, I thought one of the lines was a classic, uh, and uh, that is, uh, he said, you look at me as a fat person. Uh, I look at myself as a person, first of all, who happens to be fat, which is not an issue, you see. If, if you see people as persons, and not as uh, the, the uh, obnoxious person, the attractive person, the, uh, the uh, far-off person, the weird person, you see them as a person for whom Christ died, and uh, as a result of this, because of the, pr the uh, production of God the Holy Spirit controlling you, you do not consider a person's background, race, color, uh, IQ, culture, personality, uh, in any way. They do not even enter into your consideration at all. So unconditional love is really the professional love of the royal family of God. Each category of suffering for blessing will test and strengthen unconditional love. And when you can handle being the victim of others' mental attitude sins with unconditional love, 
then you will know that you have spiritual maturity. You see, you begin in spiritual adulthood. Now you have sufficient doctrine to motivate you to continue on your spiritual advance. And so you move from adolescence into spiritual adulthood. Once you move into spiritual adulthood, you begin with uh, the development from the source of the filling of the Spirit and Bible doctrine uh, with attraction love for God. God is so attractive. He's so wonderful, you have no problem loving Him. Once you have accomplished this and you continue your growth, you're going to find that God is going to put you to the test from time to time. There will be people testing, there will be systems testing, there will be uh, uh, all kinds of testings that will come into your life to determine. Not that God doesn't know, but so that you will know. You will begin to know uh, that you are growing spiritually because you will see some of the prejudices which you maintained in the past completely transformed and changed. And uh, you, uh, just when you start moving out into uh, loving other people, can, God is going to see that some very obstreperous person is brought across your pathway and, and given you a test. You will be brought uh, face to face with uh, some uh, situations or circumstances, uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, system, a rotten system uh, that that is going to test whether you can sh you can have an unconditional love for everyone who is involved in a circumstance and a situation like that. So the love we are commanded to have in the Bible is unconditional love and is based entirely on an individual's spiritual integrity, upon the royal family honor code, upon the execution of the plan of God upon consistent perception of Bible doctrine resulting in total and complete integrity. The object of unconditional love can be anyone. Someone who is antagonistic. Someone who is an enemy. Someone that despises you. Someone who is trying to destroy you. This is one of the greatest concepts of Christianity and it is never understood. It is impossible to love everyone with an attraction love. But it is not uh, uh, impossible to have freedom from all mental attitude sins, a relaxed mental attitude, and have which is an unconditional love for everyone. Uh, uh, it so happens that uh, currently uh, uh, I uh, work well. I overlap a little bit with a, uh, an, an, an idiot of the first class. He's a preacher, which is already two thirds, two two strikes against him, but. He is the all-night uh, personality, or, or person, or whatever, who precedes me uh, at WKZM, the Christian station. And uh, I uh, come in uh, and overlap him with only about 15 minutes. But in those 15 minutes, he has, in the, in the past, he has uh, totally and completely shown himself to be exactly what he is. Uh, and uh, uh, I have uh, had... To, uh, he has been uh, my uh, one of my tests, okay, so that uh, my uh, my choice is to have as little to do with him as possible, so that he does not uh, produce in me mental attitude sins, and uh, therefore drive me out of fellowship and lower me to his uh, uh, level. Instead. I choose to have unconditional love, which doesn't mean I gush all over him. It doesn't mean I rush in, throw my arms around him. It doesn't mean I tell him how much I love him. It means that I, I try to put him completely out of my mind so that I don't think about him at all. And when I see him, I, I uh, ask God the Holy Spirit to protect me from having mental attitude sins. Okay, can I do it for 15 minutes? Not even, in, not even for five minutes in the flesh, but in the spirit it's possible. And so uh, he just is, uh, we're, we become like two ships passing in the night. Uh, uh, I come in, do my stuff, be prepared. He finishes his stuff and slips out, and that's the way it is. Uh, and uh, what he's been uh, doing lately is uh, he, he's not supposed to leave until uh, 6 a.m. He can leave if he asks me uh, during the newscast, which, is, which goes on the air five minutes till 6. But it has been now that this, the moment he sees me walk in the door, he jumps up, says, I'm out of here, or something like that, and just leaves, just plain leaves. And now I know what to expect, and I, I thank the Lord for the opportunity to have a couple of 
uh, extra minutes to get ready uh, for my shift, signing the logs and uh, gathering uh, the uh, CDs and so forth, all the things that I have to do to get ready for my shift. And so uh, it's, it's a fantastic provision, the provision of God to, to uh, switch from attraction love to, from, uh, to those people who are not attracted to uh, unconditional love. Now, point G goes into the subject matter of uh, attract, uh, pardon me, unconditional love as a problem-solving device. Unconditional love, beloved, is that problem-solving device which is defined as unconditional love toward all mankind. Being unconditional, this category of love emphasizes the virtue of the subject rather than the attraction of the object or rapport with an object. Unconditional love toward all mankind is the ultimate expression of a person's or a Christian's or a believer's personal virtue. It is also the ultimate expression of humility, for without humility people are disoriented to life. Lack of humility creates numerous and often tragic flaws in life. Unconditional love for all man mankind is therefore the ultimate expression of virtue, humility, objectivity, and it is the basis for being receptive to Bible doctrine, which is the basis for growing in grace through the study of doctrine. Attraction love for people is optional. The Bible never commands attraction love for people, but in the plan of God for the church age, unconditional love is mandated by God as part of his plan, his will, and his purpose for your life. Now, unconditional love as a problem-solving device is mandated in all dispensations under the one phrase found in Leviticus 19.18, Love thy neighbor as you love yourself. It is also found in Matthew 19.19, Matthew 22.39, Mark 12.31, and Romans 13.9, as well as Galatians 5.14. Unconditional love is a must in your life if you are to have a life full of purpose, meaning, and definition. The Lord Jesus Christ as said in John 15, 17, referring to his, uh, what he has been teaching, he said, I command you these things that you might love each other. He said this to the disciples, most of whom were believers, after they had been together for almost three years. They had developed personality conflicts, took sides, and were critical of each other. So this command is from the Lord to them, and it is brought up, uh, brought into the Christian way of life. Now, beloved, you can't have unconditional love for people until you are properly motivated. And you can't be properly motivated until you, first of all, have capacity to love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. People who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, concentrate on the teaching of the Word of God, which is the mind of Christ. Once again... Unconditional love emphasizes the virtue of the subject rather than the attractiveness or the repulsiveness of the object. Therefore, unconditional love is a problem-solving device in human relationships. Unconditional love is the basis for having the capacity for attraction love for a few people. Now, we've talked so much about unconditional love, but I, and some of this is repeating what we've already said, but it helps to bring it into the, into the context of what we're talking about. Unconditional is an adjective which means without conditions of any kind, without personal reference to conditions, not primarily affecting or involving the emotions. It is a mental thing. So unconditional is very important as a word to describe this kind of love. Without unconditional love, you'll never have any good human relationships. You'll change friends, partners in romance, and spouses in marriage simply because you have no basis for perpetuating any of these relationships when the object of your love becomes unattractive. In fact, morality will not hold together human relationships. Morality is the basis and the cause for their breakup. Morality doesn't solve problems of the human relationship at all. Now, unconditional love does not involve personal feelings or emotions in relationship to an object. Emotion is designed to appreciate the relationship, but it is never designed to establish a relationship. Unconditional love is the ministry of God the Holy Spirit and the person who has learned the doctrine and has come to spiritual adulthood. Therefore, it becomes obvious that virtue in the Christian life is totally devoid of emotion. 
You can respond to virtue emotionally, but there's no place for emotion in the plan of God. Emotion has no ability to rationalize, to think, to apply doctrine, or to solve problems. Emotion is designed for our pleasure and enjoyment, but it was never designed for emotional sins such as fear, worry, anxiety, anger, violence, murder, jealousy, and things like that. So emotion is not a part of the Christian way of life. It's a normal function of the human soul when you respond to something you enjoy. But the only basis for true love is unconditional love, and it brings with it a wonderful emotion that is always subordinate to the principle, you see. So unconditional love is defined as that problem-solving device in the plan of God for the church age which produces unconditional love for all mankind. Unconditional love for all mankind is the ultimate expression of maximum doctrine circulating in your soul by means of God the Holy Spirit. You must have objectivity and grace orientation of, the, of a spiritually adult believer if you're going to have unconditional love in your life. Spiritual maturity guarantees that your relationships with people will be absolutely fantastic and that they will never irritate you, they will never uh, bother you, they will not cause you sleepless nights, and so forth. Therefore, if people can irritate you under any set of circumstances, mark it down, you have not yet reached spiritual maturity. Your attraction love has no staying power with anyone until you reach spiritual maturity and it is undergirded by unconditional love. It's at, it's at that point that you no longer feel threatened by anyone in all of your life. You can relax. You have a relaxed mental attitude. You have such a relaxed attitude that you accept people for the way they are, not seeking to change them all of the time. Uh, by way of illustration, uh, uh, my uh, youngest son, John, uh, elected without any, I never coerced him and nor even uh, put any pressure on him in any way uh, for him to come down uh, to Florida. Uh, he uh, just suggested that he consider it. And when he came down for a visit with us in, in August, he determined that he was going to move down here, looked up and found an apartment and later made a deposit on that apartment. He finally moved down in December, as you probably know, and before the month was out, he had made a decision to return to Fort Wayne. He received a, a very heart-rending letter from uh, one of his nieces who said that he was more of a father to uh, her than his, her father was, and, and that she missed him and she needed him, and she and, uh, asked him to come back, etc., etc. And so he uh, made an emotional decision he was going to return. And then he came to me and he told me that uh, he knew I would be disappointed and I made it very clear that it was his decision to make. It was not my decision and it had nothing to do with me whatsoever except the fact that I was here and would be uh, close to him here, not, not up there, if that's what, one of the things he wanted. But when he told his brother, Bob, he, Bob read him the riot act and every time he's talked to him on the phone, he has preached to, to John about how stupid he is and how he, how he has made errors and mistakes in this kind of a thing. And uh, it, 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 uh, uh, he's uh, telling John exactly how he should live his life. He is uh, 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 d determining what someone else should do with his life. He does not have orientation to unconditional love which says, John, you do what you want to do. It's, a, it's, it's a, up to you. Can, and when I help you, uh, it's not because I want something in return. Uh, he, he re John received some financial help from some of the family uh, uh, to help him move down here. And uh, he uh, has promised to repay them. When he came to me and he said, I will repay you what you have cloned me. And I said, my boy, that was not a loan. It was a gift. And there's no way you can repay me for it because I didn't give it to you with conditions that you succeed or you stay or you do this or that or anything. I gave it to you on the basis of the fact that you were, had a need and I was able to do something to help and I was glad to be able to do it and it was a total gift with no strings attached. And the, but the difference uh, is, is, is in unconditional love. And uh, sometimes it's possible um, to be so uh, exasperated with someone and the things that they do 
Perhaps they do it repeatedly, but whatever. The things that they do, that it, is, uh, it, it causes mental attitude sins. And that, that leads me to say that unconditional love is related to humility. The status of unconditional love for all human beings is a very, very important, uh, importantly related to the subject of humility. You see, arrogant people are constantly seeking unconditional love from others. But all they offer in return is conditional love. The greater your arrogance, the more conditions you put on someone's love. Most men do this to the women they love. Many women do it to the men that they love. And uh, women very often will withhold sex uh, from their husbands because they have not met certain conditions in their lives. Many men are so arrogant that they uh, make life miserable for the woman who does not meet certain conditions in, in life. You see, the lust pattern of the arrogance complex covets many, many things. And when, when the old sin nature is controlling the believer, he is in real trouble. They want many, many things. Uh, the arrogance pattern wants wealth without honor. Success without integrity. Promotion without ability. Approbation without achievement. Love without virtue. And, very often, ministers who covet someone else's pulpit and someone else's congregation. If you want any of these things, you're definitely not a candidate for unconditional love. Unconditional love is a problem-solving device in human relationships. You will love those who you know, some people you do not know, friends or enemies, people who are attractive or repulsive, those who are honorable or dishonorable, those who are loving or hateful, people who are appreciative or antagonistic, people who are rich, people who are poor. You will have a complete, unconditional love for every other member of the human race. Freedom from any mental attitude sins. Unconditional love is absolutely necessary if you are ever going to get a hearing from the Supreme Court in heaven over some of the problems, uh, people, that you have, that you are, are want to turn over to the Supreme Court of heaven. For you see, if, if you have uh, unconditional love, you accept a person and they they do as my mother has said, they do you dirt. You, if you have no mental attitude, sins at all toward them, have unconditional love, you can take and appeal that case to the Supreme Court of Heaven, leave it in the hands of God, and He will take care of it. On the other hand, if someone does you dirt, and you have mental attitude, sins, you see, you are in no position to commit that problem or that person to the Supreme Court of Heaven. Pardon me. Unconditional love is unconditional because of the grace orientation that comes from Bible doctrine resident in the soul. Unconditional love, therefore, perpetuates its own honor, its own integrity, its own virtue in every stage of your spiritual life. And it does so without retaliation, without revenge, without prejudice, without discrimination, without arrogance, without hatred, without self-righteousness, self-pity, jealousy, implacability, vindictiveness, slander, gossip, maligning, controlling, or without judging other people. If you can see someone uh, do something and, and not judge their motives, okay, you're well on your way towards spiritual maturity. But attraction love, minus the virtue of unconditional love, is the weakest and most unstable status quo in life. It's vulnerable to the entire realm of both arrogant sins and emotional sins. Therefore, it is imperative that you understand unconditional love is a problem-solving device for your living as a member of this human race, a relaxed attitude toward everyone. You would be surprised, beloved, how wonderful it is to be able to go through life without having the millstone of mental attitude sins toward people particularly those people who rub you the wrong way, particularly those people who are not only unattractive, 
but they are actually repulsive. They are, uh, they just antagonize you. And this is uh, what our course, uh, what our Lord meant. Uh, uh, happy are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. <laughs> well, of course. Happy are you in a situation, in a circumstance like that. But you can only be happy if they don't bother you because you have mental, uh, unconditional love. You can, be, you can have inner happiness, you can be exceedingly glad for, for this kind of a thing. Well, let's look at a few passages of Scripture. Some I have already uh, read to you when we began because I didn't want to wait till we got to this point and then go into them. Uh, but let me, uh, for, let me begin with Galatians 5.14, a passage which we'll be taking up very shortly in our study of Galatians chapter 5. It's one of the verses I quoted earlier. It says, For the entire law is fulfilled in one doctrine. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is the future active indicative of the verb agapao. The imperative future tense is used instead of the imperative mood to express a command in this situation. Therefore, the believer is commanded to produce the action of the verb, which he'll do when he has attained spiritual adulthood and even more so in spiritual maturity. He will not be able to fully comply until he reaches spiritual maturity, uh, but uh, then it will be unstable uh, uh, until he reaches spiritual maturity. That is, when you, when you begin, you can begin to comply at spiritual adulthood, but it will be unstable until you reach spiritual maturity. Neighbor is the Greek word plesion. It looks like this, P-L-E-A-T-A-S-I-O-N. And it simply refers to anyone in your vicinity or your periphery, anyone with whom you have contact in any day. The Greek reflexive pronoun, pronoun seautou, S-E-A-U-T-O-U, refers to the, the action back to yourself. But you don't love yourself unless you first love God, otherwise it's arrogance. And so you are commanded here to love your neighbor as you love yourself, not in arrogance, but uh, in, uh, in spiritual self-esteem. Uh, second verse is found in John 15, 12. This is my mandate, that you love each other as I have loved you. We saw that also in, in uh, the 13th of John. Now, he says, love as I have loved you. How did the Lord Jesus Christ love us? Unconditionally. Why? Because we were imperfect. And why, does, uh, why was that necessary? Because all men are sinners. Because of his attraction, love for God the Father, and his unconditional love toward the entire human race, the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross where he was judged for our sins. Now, once we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we receive God's perfect righteousness, which God always loves. Now, since that perfect righteousness is imputed to us or charged to us, it is not our righteousness, it's the righteousness of God. Since it's imputed to us, now the Lord Jesus Christ loves us with an attraction love directed toward the divine righteousness which is in us because of imputation. So, love each other as I have loved you. John 15, 17, I command you these things that you might love one another. 1 John 3, 23, again, furthermore, this is his mandate that we believe in the person of his Son and that we love each other as he gave us mandate. And 1 John 4.7, 1 John 4.11, uh, which we've already read. And then 1 John 4.20 and 21. If someone should allege, I love God, and yet he hates his fellow believer, he is a liar. For he who does not love his fellow believer whom he has seen is not able to love God whom he has not seen. So even our love for God is based on the virtue of unconditional love, which comes from Bible doctrine. Furthermore, we have this mandate from him that he who loves God should also love his fellow believer. First comes your, attractive, uh, your attraction love for God, from which comes your spiritual growth and your spiritual believer. And when combined with testing, it produces spiritual maturity, at which point you have the ability to love everyone unconditionally. <clears throat> Looking at 1 John 4, 9 to 12 and 16, by this, the love of God was manifest in our case, 
because God the Father has sent his unique Son into the world in order that through him we might be saved. By this love exists, not because we love God, but because he loved us, unconditional love for all mankind, and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God loves us, loved us, and he does, we also become obligated to keep on loving each other with unconditional love. No one has seen God at any time. If we love each other, God resides in us and his love has been fulfilled in us, the production of the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, we have come to know and we have believed the love which God keeps having for us. God is love. Ephesians 1.5, by means of love, God's unconditional love, he has predestined us for the purpose of adoption to himself according to the grace purpose of his will. Our Lord's description of unconditional love is given in a beautiful passage found in Luke 6, verses 27 to 37. In Luke 6, 27, he says, But I say to you who are listening to me, keep on loving your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Now these mandates can never be fulfilled, beloved, by any human power. They can only be fulfilled by divine power, from, which comes from Bible doctrine and the filling of the Spirit. To verse 28, Bless those who curse you and pray for those who abuse you. <laughs> I don't care who you are. There's no human ability or strength or power capable of fulfilling these mandates. Verse 29. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer him the other also. Furthermore, from the man who takes your coat, do not keep back your undercoat. Verse 30. Give to everyone who asks you and stop demanding the return of your goods from him who takes them. This is a dynamic of spiritual power and can never be accomplished through attraction love. Verses 31 and following, And just as you desire that men do to you, do to them likewise. Furthermore, if you love those who love you, and you do, first class condition, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. Even if you do good to those who do good to you, maybe you will, maybe you won't, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. In other words, just because people do good to someone does not mean that they, that person appreciates it. Capacity for appreciation is very limited. Verse 37. Furthermore, even if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive it back, maybe you will, maybe you won't, third class condition, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full, but love your enemies. Do good and lend without expecting to get anything in return. And your reward will be great, that you will be the sons of the Most High. For he himself is benevolent to the ungrateful and to the evil. That's the way we should. Become merciful just as your Father is merciful. And stop judging, and you will never be judged. Stop condemning others, and you will never be condemned. Be forgiving, and you will be forgiven. Here we have a strong uh, a mandate from God the, the Son. Uh, and a beautiful description of unconditional love. Uh, Paul's description of unconditional love is found in Romans 12, verses 14 to 21. It's part of the uh, royal family honor code. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be thinking the same things, that is, divine viewpoint, toward each other. Do not be thinking in terms of arrogance, but associate with humble people. Stop being wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is honorable in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live in harmony with all mankind. Beloved, stop avenging yourselves. Instead, give place to the punishment of the justice of God, the Supreme Court of Heaven. For it stands permanently written, Punishment belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. So if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For by so doing, you will pile coals of fire burning on his head. Stop being conquered by evil, but conquer evil by means of the absolute good. May I take a moment to refer to that, uh, this passage which talks about uh, piling, uh, uh, burning coals on his head. Um, this is a quotation from Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. It may refer to a ritual in Egypt in which a person showed his repentance by carrying a pan of burning charcoal on his head. 
helping rather than cursing an enemy may cause him to be ashamed and penitent as Paul summarizes do not be overcome with evil another uh, explanation uh, has been given and that is that there were no matches in that time and therefore uh, fires were only started from uh, burning coals taken from one fire and put on another very often uh, in the Middle East these were carried in a in a censer uh, on the top of the person's head and uh, if you uh, if a person were to ask you you'd give him one coal uh, that would be all you were required to do but uh, if you wanted to really uh, be a blessing you really help them you would pile coals of fire uh, burning uh, burning on his head and he would have more than sufficient to make sure that his fire would start so uh, I don't think it has the idea that by doing good you you make him feel ashamed or you do uh, uh, some uh, something to uh, to harm him uh, and uh, th that would be a total uh, misconception of what unconditional love is all about all right moving on now Paul unconditional love is related to spiritual adulthood Leviticus 19:18. you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your people but you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself this is not arrogance at all it is as I have said previously spiritual self self-esteem again Matthew 19 19 and 22 39 talking about loving your neighbor as yourself same is true in Mark 12 30 to 31 and again John 15 17 uh, Hebrews 13 1 says let brotherly love continue first uh, Peter 1 22 talks about the non hypocritical love of the brethren uh, 1 John 4, 7, and uh, we've already seen that. Uh, James describes unconditional love as the royal law of the church in James uh, 2, verse 8. If, however, you are, you are fulfilling the royal law, which is you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself, on the basis of Scripture, in this you are doing well. Uh, the doctrine of unconditional love is a royal law for the family of God. Unconditional love is related to the believer's status quo in spiritual adulthood. The royal law of the royal uh, family is mandated. The royal law of unconditional love implies that spiritual adulthood is necessary. For a part of unconditional love is that you never feel threatened by hostility, by hatred, by enmity, by any form of antagonism or anything that is done to you unjustly. And this is also a part of spiritual adulthood. It's a relaxed mental attitude the solution of unconditional love in spiritual adulthood is point I in spiritual maturity you finally reach the maximum application of unconditional love as you face testing in spiritual maturity you use unconditional love as a problem-solving device you will apply unconditional love toward those who hate you you will apply unconditional love to those who are rude to you those who malign you and slander you, those who are obnoxious, those people who are trying to make life miserable for you, who hate you. Unconditional love is the application to people testing, whether uh, uh, where people either love you or they hate you. So spiritual maturity is the place of fantastic tranquility because of unconditional love. It just, it, it just doesn't bother you. Now, let me hasten to say, now, your first reaction may well be reaction because it catches you off guard and you may react with mental attitude sins or retaliation of some sort but once you stop for a moment and this is where faith rest comes in someone has attacked you now you find a promise that will stop your panic that will cause you to stop in your tracks and you move into some, uh, the doctrinal rationales, begin thinking doctrines that you have learned, and pretty soon you can quickly shift into unconditional love. When, spiritual, when you reach spiritual adulthood and you are facing these tests, and you pass these tests, and you keep on taking in doctrine, keep on taking in doctrine, you finally reach spiritual maturity. In spiritual maturity, you have the greatest of all advantages of life. You can handle the problems which are created by attraction love. And what do I mean by that? Beloved, it doesn't make any difference how attractive a person is. Sooner or later, they're going to do something, say something, be something 
that something's going to happen in which they will not be attractive to you. If you're married, you're going to have to understand that there is going to be a time in your life when your mate is going to be most unattractive. Now, if you don't have anything undergirding it, that's when divorce takes place. Some people can never, ever recover from being hurt by a mate. Unless they have unconditional love, it can be a disaster for that marriage. But uh, unconditional love is developed in the stages of spiritual adulthood. When you first enter spiritual adulthood, there's little unconditional love. But at the point of spiritual maturity, there's fantastic unconditional love, along with happiness, tranquility, and power that comes from unconditional love and spiritual maturity. And it's almost beyond description. It's absolutely fantastic. Now, the advance to each stage of spiritual adulthood occurs through a category of suffering for blessing, testings that are in the form of suffering. Therefore, it is inevitable that each category of suffering for blessing will test and strengthen unconditional love. Okay. And now, if God doesn't expect you, he's not going to give you the ultimate test until you reach spiritual maturity. But you're going to have enough tests in your spiritual adulthood to prepare you for the big test of spiritual maturity. As you enter spiritual adulthood, as I've said, unconditional love is very wobbly and unstable. But spiritual adulthood is protected from arrogance by means of suffering for blessing. In spiritual maturity, through the further testings of people and system testings, unconditional love becomes very powerful, a great dynamic in your life, and a source of great happiness. You'll have greater happiness from unconditional love toward everyone than from attraction love toward a few. Testing is the challenge to spiritual maturity. When all your friends and loved ones turn against you, you really need strong, unconditional love for all, and you're going to have it if you are in spiritual maturity. Spiritual adulthood has attraction love for God, gained through the Bible doctrine one has learned to this point. But it has not yet fully attained unconditional love. Only after you pass suffering for blessing to attain spiritual maturity do you have unconditional love for all that's really strong and powerful. So spiritual maturity possesses that spiritual muscle to fulfill all the divine mandates regarding unconditional love for all mankind. Just remember, beloved, you can never execute God's commands in the energy of the flesh. Attraction love is an energy of the flesh method of operation. Whether it's good or bad attraction, love depends on the persons involved. But no part of God's plan is fulfilled by attraction love for others. Spiritual maturity passes through the valley of testing. The unconditional love of spiritual maturity is tested and used in people testing, thought testing, and systems testing, which are three of the four categories which are involved in momentum testing. Point J, the integrity of unconditional love. Ah, yes, unconditional love has all the integrity in human relationships. Spiritual maturity gives the power to love everyone, everyone in your periphery, the brethren, mankind, the, the, the good, the bad, the ugly. Unconditional love is a problem-solving device and the foundation for all successful personal relationships in life. Your romance, your friendships, your associations will be short-lived unless you have the base of unconditional love to solve the inevitable, pro inevitable problems caused by living with and associating with imperfect people. So unconditional love is the stabilizer of attraction love. Unconditional love is a spiritual function of the royal family of God and cannot be duplicated by the unbeliever or the believer out of fellowship in the cosmic world system. Unconditional love can only be attained through the consistent enabling power of God the Holy Spirit and momentum which comes from Bible doctrine. Yes, I think all the time we'll have will be go for today. We'll have to be uh, given in, in point K, which talks about divine uh, love and partiality. The love of God as a divine attribute is complete and total from eternity past. 
This means that God does not fall in love. He's not attracted to you or to me. He does not maintain his love. It's part of his eternal being. The attribute of divine love makes it impossible for any member of the Godhead ever to compromise his integrity. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ had to go to the cross. The, in the justice of God is the most important thing we deal with in life. Integrity is always more important than love. Therefore, the divine attribute of love is always linked to his divine holiness or his divine integrity. And divine holiness or integrity is a combination of his justice and his righteousness. Because of this, all divine government and all of God's administration to his creatures is related directly to his justice. The justice of God has absolute authority over all creatures. In the garden, God set up a perfect system of justice. God mandated no regarding the tree of good and evil. Divine justice was the issue in the garden. Spiritual death was the result of the rejection of in divine integrity. If it had been a love relationship, there would have been no tree, no good, and evil. Because of God's infinite perfection and the very nature of his attributes, justice functions with total impartiality, regardless of whether it involves blessing or cursing. Second Chronicles 19.7 Let the occupation of the Lord be upon you. Be very careful what you do, for Yahweh our Elohim will have no part in unrighteousness or partiality or taking a bribe. God used his integrity, his justice and righteousness to judge Jesus Christ on the cross rather than succumbing for all creatures. In the garden, God set up a perfect system of justice. God mandated no regarding the tree of good and evil. Divine justice was the issue in the garden. Spiritual death was the result of the rejection of in divine integrity. If it had been a love relationship, 